Um, so yeah, I know that the whole buyback of water for the environment, all that sort of thing is quite contentious, especially in the local area. But um, I guess I can sort of present an example of where some of that pain that's been borne by the irrigators locally, well, some of that water is actually coming back into your backyard and is being used um, for good purposes in Gumbau Forest. So I know that not everyone in the room is a local, so I thought I'd better point out exactly where Gumbau Forest is. So it's a um, 20,000 hectare floodplain forest on the Murray River. So it's bought, um, Turumbri is down the bottom end of the forest and then Kundruk's up the top. So we're sitting up the top near the star there. I think the star spins. There we are. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in terms of land tenure and things, uh, half of Gumbau is National Park, the, the top part of the forest. And that is a fairly recent national park that came out through the River Red Gum VIAC inquiry. So it was gazetted in 2010. Um, and then this other sort of brownie colour, that's state forest. And it's still commercially logged today and is a source of domestic firewood as well. So it's a multi-use forest. Um, it's not all um, just about the, the birds and the animals and the trees. It's also used um, commercially. So. The forest is uh, bordered by the Murray River to the north all the way along and then also by private land and then the Gumbau Creek along the side. So Gumbau Creek actually forms an anabranch of the Murray leaving just upstream of Turumbri Weir and flowing all the way back down at, just down here at Kundruk. So under um, natural conditions, the, when, the for, when the river is flooding, water flows into the forest and spreads down across the forest floor and, and creates our wetlands and things like that. So Gumbauer is um, a very special place in terms of all the different diversity of wetland types that it has. Um, and this is just a couple of examples. So the forest has semi-permanent wetlands and also permanent wetlands, but when it floods, it becomes one gigantic wetland. So in 2010, over 9,000 hectares of the forest was flooded. So that's 9,000 hectares of feeding and breeding grounds for our water birds. The wetlands aren't all the same, they're different. Some are deep and maintain water for a long time and very, very rarely dry out. Others have sort of gently sloping sides and they have reeds and, wet and Eleocharis and all different types of wetland vegetation on their edges, which is a great areas for our water birds to, to hide in and also for brog, frogs to feed, uh, breed and all that sort of stuff. So great food for our, our water birds. So yeah, the, because of what the forest has all these different types of wetlands, it can support a really large number of birds. So thousands and thousands of birds are supported by Gumbau Forest, but also there's a huge number of different types of water, uh, types of birds as well. So there's over a hundred species that are known to um, be in Gumbau, and in terms of water birds, there's over 22. There's about 22 species that use Gumbau Forest for for breeding in these wetlands. So when the forest floods, a lot of the fish <coughs> fish come in from the river and from the creek as well, and um, breed up in the wetlands and they're a really important um, source of food for our water birds when they're breeding. And that's one of the main reasons that um, we get these really large breeding events in the forest of colonial water birds. So colonial water birds are birds that um, breed in big numbers and they actually breed in like what I call sort of high rise apartments in terms you'll have a lower level of sort of ibis and things like that and then you have a middle story which is sort of the, the cormorants and then up the top in the penthouse is all the egrets. So you get this high rise of um, bre breeding birds all in the same sort of area. So yeah, Gumbau is internationally famous, so Inca was talking about some of those um, international agreements and things like that that help protect water birds in Australia. And Gumbau is likely enough to be what we call a Ramsar site, so it was listed in 1982 as a wetland of international significance. It also has habitat for species listed under the international agreements that have also been mentioned this morning. So. The Jamba is the Japan-Australia Migratory Bird Agreement and then the Camber is the China-Australia Migratory Bird Agreement. So our egrets and also like the um, white-bellied seagulls, some of those species are listed under those agreements and they 
find homes and breed in Gumbau. So Gumbau is an important place for those areas. And because Australia signed up to those agreements, then Australia has an obligation to protect areas like Gumbau to support our, our important bird species. So just over the river in New South Wales is Kundruk Paracuta Forest. And when uh, we combine Kundruk Paracuta and Gumbau together, they form the second largest river egg gum forest in Australia. Um, and the other one is that also when you combine those two forests together, they're also a Living Murray icon site. So I don't know if many people know much about the Living Murray, but it's been going for almost a decade now. And it's something that the basin states all signed up to. So Victoria, New South Wales, South Australia and the Commonwealth all got together and said, right, you know, we want to um, protect some of our most important areas in the Murray-Darling Basin, and they're called icon sites. And so they all got together and that's where the Flooding for Life project was born. Uh, Gumbau Forest also has um, some of the most rarest wetland types in, in Victoria as well. So it's a very important um, area for, for water birds. Today, um, so Gumbau has got this really historical kind of um, history of water bird breeding. And what I'm talking about here is colonial water birds because obviously species like ducks and swans and grebes, they are able to breed in Gumbau most years because we have that permanent sort of water bodies. But one of the most amazing things about Gumbau is it supports these really large breeding events. So these flood events here, I've just picked out um, these in terms of the last 40 years. We've had three really big breeding events. Um, so 73, 74, 74, 75 and 93, 94. And what should really go on the list as well is 2010, 11. So I was just going to um, show a video now, let's see if I can do that. It's an archive video of um, the 70s floods and it just gives you an understanding of sort of what the forest was like way, way back then. Not that it's that far away, but how, and locals would certainly know um, how, it, how it has changed significantly from the 70s. It's all natural history filmmakers for yeah. a long time and we visited the, the Barnum Forest, the Sunshot and also the Young Bat Forest which was flooded at the time. Murray was in flood, the flood was created a lot of breeding birds and animals and so we spent some many days travelling by boat through the forest and I'd be next on a, 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 a cut off stunt to film some okay. birds nesting and that as a bit of an example of what um, Gumbau could be with environmental watering um, because it's those really large bird breeding events where we had hundreds of nests within the colony that were really are really important for these colonial water bird species so it's during that time that there's mass recruitment of, um, of young birds into the population because those sort of breeding events they rely on really big flood events and really big flood events don't happen every year 
Um, so in, for example, in 1974 there was an estimated 500 nests and many, many different species from um, egrets to naki night herons, um, ibis and darters and cormorants all breeding at the same time. So it was those, those events are really important. Um, and you get that, that full suite of species breeding at the same time in the, the lower and the central areas of the forest. However, due to river regulation, those, those flood events um, don't happen as often as they used to. We've heard from Inca about river regulation is one of the biggest threats to our water bird populations. Um, and so if we don't have those really, big those really big flood events, we just don't have the conditions where the water birds can recruit in really large numbers. So that's why we've seen the, a decline in the, the water bird numbers, like egrets especially, uh, and that's why they're now threatened or critically endangered and all that sort of thing. So just as an example in terms of what river regulation has um, impacted on Gumbau Forest, um, I just wanted to put this table up to try and demonstrate that point in terms of um, the impact of sort of river regulation and also climate change. So the Murray-Darling Basin Authority has done a lot of modelling on how often the forest used to flood and how often it floods now and that sort of thing. And that's where this table comes from. So you can see here that these sustained flood events, so a 35,000 mega day flow in the Murray River, and that might not mean much to many people, but at 35,000 megs a day, that's when the river's up and it's broken its banks and is flooding water into the forest. And these used, and these used to occur fairly re regularly, but these ones here that used to last for three months or more, that's when you have large bird breeding events in Gumbau Forest. So you can see under natural conditions, so prior to river regulation, prior to dams and weirs and things like that, they used to happen every four and a half years out of ten. But now, under um, current conditions, they only happen every one and a half years out of ten. So it's a significant change in the frequency of those events. So you could almost say that, you know, we used to have those really big events every four and a half years out of ten, but now they're only every one and a half years out of ten. And under a median climate change scenario, which really doesn't mean much, but under one type of scenario for climate change, there's all different permutations that have been investigated. By 2030, they're saying it's less than one year in 10 that we'll have these events. So that's where um, environmental watering can help sort of fill that gap and try and replicate some of those more natural events. So a component of um, the Living Murray project and the Flooding Fly project that I've been working on has been building new infrastructure in the forest to enable us to deliver large volumes of environmental water to the forest. So we've investigated a number of different options over the years and looked at all the different requirements of the, of the birds, of the fish and the vegetation and what they need and come up with a number of different, I guess, levers in the forest that we can pull to deliver water. So we have some small regulators down in the lower part of the forest like the Black Swamp Regulator and the Yarn Creek Regulator and they are able, we're able to deliver water to target specific areas in the forest and especially some of our really high value wetlands that need that more um, frequent watering that we need for um, our permanent wetlands. But then in the sort of central part of the forest we've also built what's called the Hippo Road Package of Worth that Di mentioned when she was doing her introduction. So we have a new weir in the Gumbau Creek and also a channel here that connects the Gumbau Creek, which is just outside the photo there, to the Gumbau Forest here. So this has all just been constructed last year. And with, these, um, with this infrastructure in place, we can now deliver environmental water on a scale that we've never been able to achieve for Gumbau before. Um, and all up, this is about a $22 million investment in the forest health. Um, and it'll help us to achieve our objectives for water birds, red gums, wetlands, frogs and fish. Um, so with the Hippo Road Channel here, this is where we can deliver, you know, up to 190 gig litres in one event and we can flood over almost 5,000 hectares of the forest and that's actually filling 80% of the wetlands in the forest and watering 30% of the river red gums. So something we couldn't do without this type of infrastructure and something that we wouldn't be able to do um, with just you know, normal river flows and that sort of thing. So this is just a map showing um, the area of inundation that we can achieve. So this is Hippo Road Channel here. So the water is diverted through the, through the Gumbau Creek and injected through the channel, just like an irrigation scheme. 
Um, it connects into a natural creek line in the, in the forest called Spur Creek and it's injected and it flows down and spills out and um, basically the, the flood runners and the wetlands, they fill up and break their banks and water spreads across the forest. So this year we'll be actually delivering waters for the first time through the Hippo Road Channel. So we're actually going to start in a couple of weeks and try and mimic this natural flood event. Um, with these, this type of infrastructure in place, um, we have great flexibility in what we can do in terms of we don't have to deliver um, water 5,000 hectares every time. We can, um, we can do different types of things. For example, um, I just mentioned that we're going to do the large flood event this year because the forest is still recovering from the millennium drought and, the, and it's just been in a drying event and ecologically timing is right for a large flood event. And that uses up to 66 gigalitres of environmental water. So it's a huge amount of water, but we won't necessarily need to do that every year. We can do also what we call a piggyback flow. So if the Murray River comes up naturally and starts to spill into the forest, often what happens now is those, those flood events actually don't last very long, they're quite short. So the river comes up and then it drops away again. Um, and so what we can actually do is we can put water on top of that natural flood event to extend the duration um, of the flooding and maybe help try and promote some bird breeding events. Then we can also do um, what we call top up flows, which through those smaller regulators in the lower part of the forest and target specific objectives, which is most likely to be around water birds and also fish as well. So it's really, it's really um, great that we now have these um, infrastructure because we can start to target different types of things and try and um, create conditions that are good for our birds to breed. So when we do decide to deliver environmental water to the forest, um, it's often, like I said, for many ecological reasons. It's not just for birds, it's for many different things. But if we are designing um, an environmental water event for water birds, we have to take into a, a large number of different things. Um, so some of the things that we might sort of consider is the flood extent, because the bigger the flood event, the more food there is for the um, birds to feed on, and there's a more habitat for them. So that can influence the size of your, of your event in terms of the size of your colonies and things. The depth of flooding is also really important in terms of under colonial water birds um, breeding areas, we know that if a sharp drop occurs in the in a wetland, that can actually cause your water birds to abandon their chicks, and so their their chicks might fly off, and um, oh, their their adults might fly off and leave the chicks to starve. So we need to take that into consideration. Climatic triggers are also really important. We're always going to have a better ecological response if we water um, in, in tandem with natural sort of cues. So, for example, if the flood, if the Murray River is also is having a bit of a flood event, we'll often get a bigger, a better um, breeding response. Um, where the birds are breeding, so what colony they're using, because there's colonies in the lower part of the forest and there's and also in the central part of the forest will determine which regulators we use um, is also important. The number of birds breeding is also critical in terms of if we have a really big event and we've got hundreds of nests, obviously the requirement, the food requirement for those adults is really important. So we need to make sure we maintain enough food within the forest for all those um, adults to feed their chicks. And also the stage of breeding, so that could be nesting, laying, hatching or fledging. Um, so birds are more likely to abandon their nests when the amount of energy they've invested is low in their breeding event. So for example, they've just, if they're just starting to make their nest or they've just laid their eggs and all of a sudden the, the water starts to drop away, they're more likely to fly away. But if they're up to sort of, they've got um, chicks in the nest and they're close to fledging, they're off, they'll stay um, around more often. So that could also influence when we deliver water and how much we deliver. So it's a very uh, complex kind of process. I guess that's my key message in terms of when we're delivering environmental water, it's not an exact science. It's, we have to take into all these different considerations and um, we have a lot of monitoring in place to try and make sure we're doing the right thing. Uh, so yeah, a recent success story. So yeah, someone mentioned the millennium drought today. And obviously Gumbau Forest suffered significantly throughout that with only 
Throughout that whole decade period, only 10% of the forest received water, either through a natural small inflow from the Murray or through environmental watering that we did. Uh, so we saw a massive decline in our red gums, especially our, our wetlands dried out. We didn't have any large scale, any water bird breeding for many, many years. But in 2010-11, that drought in Gumbau was broken um, by the natural flood event. And over nine, as I said, over 9,000 hectares of the forest was flooding, flooded, creating this gigantic wetland that was just a haven for our water birds. And we had two main breeding colonies established in the forest. This photo here shows the colony in the Little Gumbau wetland complex. Um, and then the other colony was up in the high air, in a, the central part of the forest called the Little Reedy wetland complex. And most of the birds were around Green Swamp then. But this photo here of Little Gumbau is the largest colony. Um, and we had five species detected that were breeding. So that included the um, Australasian data, the little pied cormorant, little black cormorant, white ibis and also the eastern great egret as well. Uh, we had approximately 250 breeding pairs of the great egrets in the colony with many successfully fledging and they did this without any environmental water intervention or anything like that. That was just purely on the back of a natural flood event. Um, so we did a lot of aerial surveys and things like that and we also we were also in the forest a lot, um, trying to count the birds and seeing what they were up to as well. But following that major flood event in 2010-11, uh, the forest received some more natural flooding event in 2012, but not that really big long event. It was more sort of short, sharp um, inflows, which topped up our wetlands and still maintained excellent sort of breeding and um, feeding habitat for our water birds. So during that, um, during 2000 and late 2011 and things, we were still monitoring our colonies. And in November 2011, we found that um, another colony, a, a colony had kept on breeding. So we had a medium sized colony in the Little Gumbau wetland complex, about 50 to 60 pairs of egrets and about 100 pairs of cormorants. So during these events, we're monitoring every fortnight, going out, checking what they're up to. And one of the reports that came back in sort of mid-November was that they felt that the water, bit, the water levels in, under the colony were starting to drop away. Mm -hmm. And that the egrets at the time in November were only just sort of starting to, were still sitting on their eggs and things. Um, and they were close to hatching, but hadn't quite yet. So then we went back in early December and yet the egrets are still there, they're still committing to breeding. They were um, now sitting on sort of, had young chicks and we were feeding young chicks. But we were seeing our water levels under those nests starting to drop away because it was starting to heat up, it was summer and um, the evaporation in the forest was starting to increase. And so we made a decision then to um, request a, an environmental water allocation from the Murray-Darling Basin Authority and that was one gigalitre of water. And we used that to deliver water through one of those lower landscape regulators, one of the small regulators in the forest, to inject it into, un, into the area where these birds were breeding. And we were able to um, continue monitoring it and um, maintain those water levels throughout that summer. So it was only a small kind of flow. We delivered about 10 to 11, 12 megalitres per day. So it's quite a small volume. Um, and we continue monitoring it and we found that um, all of our water birds were able to successfully fledge their young for a second year in a row, which was great.